swim bait. That's an eight and a half, nine pounder right there. Slaughtered it and had a big and just be. DM double buzz bait right there, double blade. Woo! That's what we're punching for, baby. That's what we're punching for. Yeah! Hey, what's up guys? Nick the Informative Fisherman here, and today we're gonna be talking about how to catch giant bass. Guys ask me all the time, Nick, how, do, how are you getting these giant bass? How are you catching these trophies? And a lot of the mentality of anglers that I see that are amateur and even tour level guys are still on the, I need to get 20 bites to compete that day. If you're not in a tournament, you have the freedom to fish for three bites. So you can fish bigger baits to try to encourage bigger fish. I'm gonna get into that and I'm gonna talk also about how to fish tournaments and still catch bigger fish with the normal baits, but how to make it an appeal to those bigger fish uh, a little bit more often. Today we're gonna be talking about the gear, the line, the hooks, the baits, how to use these baits to appeal to those bigger bass and how to go find them. So let's get you on some big ones and fill your head full of some new knowledge. Now before I get into picking up a lure and start breaking it down for you, I need to explain the mentality of the guys who catch bigger bass. What's going on is these guys have 100% focus all the time. They're not going down the bank just winging, hoping they're going to catch a big bass. They're focused on the right conditions, the location, the bait, the sky, everything. So let's get started on that subject. The first thing you need to realize when you're fishing for bigger bass is you're fishing for three to five bites. Not three to five fish, you're fishing for three to five bites. You want a fish that's gonna blow up on a double buzz bait or a big swim bait. If you get three to five bites on those and you happen to capitalize on three, the fish that eat this nine times out of 10 are over five pounds. You get three of those, that's 15 pounds. If you have a co-angler with you, he feels the difference, you're well into the 20 pound mark. I don't care where you're at in the country, if you're consistently getting over 20 pounds, man, you're cashing a check every time. I can pretty much guarantee you that. So the first thing you need to realize is, I'm fishing all day long for three to five bites. So don't get road stare. You have to stay 100% focused on following that weed line, hitting that point at just the right angle, uh, looking at the direction of the wind, making sure you present your bait correctly 100% of the time and, and not get frustrated that you're not getting the bites. Or let's say you throw for three hours on a bait like this and then you feel one load up and he comes off. How do you not lose your cool in that moment is experience and what you have to realize is when you start fishing for bigger fish you're gonna have a day that goes by and you're gonna fish all day long and you're gonna feel two fish grab it big fish grab it tug on it and you're gonna lose them and you're gonna say ah this this just frustrates you all all the heck you know and you lose your cool about it when realistically if you would have focused and said, what did I do to get those bites and be satisfied with your trophy attempt at chasing that and know what you're gonna improve on next time instead of telling yourself, that sucked, forget it, I'm not doing it again. Looking at those key things that where you did get bit and why you got bit is going to help you the next time you get out there to get that one or two more extra bites and possibly capitalize on those ones that you miss. Because that's what happens when you're searching for three to five, you may get three to five opportunities. And you can very easily miss those opportunities. Just like in the recent Clear Lake episode shoot, uh, I fished all day, I got blanked. I was fishing a big buzz bait and I was fishing this big old swim bait. I was even fishing a frog. I had a bunch of big fish commit. I just didn't get them in the boat. That happens, but I was positive, went out there the next morning with Paul again and cracked some big ones because I knew Hey, I was on them, I was capitalizing on them. Uh, my execution, something was slightly off. Maybe it was my mindset, maybe it was my hook set timing, but I knew to stay cool and knew I was getting the bites and focus on what I needed to do. So now, let's get into our baits. So as we start getting into the baits, I'm gonna reference back to something here for you real quick. Um, if you don't understand the seasonal patterns of bass, where they're at in the early spring, pre-spawn, uh, transition phases, where they're located, you should really look up more about that. 
Um, understanding, you know, if it's overcast that the fish are going to be more actively feeding, the head of a front, they're going to be more actively feeding. If you don't understand the basics of that, uh, go back and watch my fishing conditions and elements video. Um, that's going to help you better locate where those bigger fish should be. Uh, because if you start searching for those three to five bites and you don't have an idea where they're at, those three to five are going to be zero to one. Um, so go watch the fishing conditions and elements and you can click this link right here on the bottom and get back to that. Okay, so now we're going to get into it. First thing I'm going to pick up right here is a buzz bait. Everybody knows buzz baits make a ton of commotion across the surface. I'll show you the video of that. Um, what they do is they displace a ton of surface Bam, bam, splashing, ton of displacement in the water, a ton of noise. What buzz baits do is they present something on the surface that's large and that's panicking. It's in stress mode, it's running. Uh, recently, I've switched over to the double buzz bait after talking to Paul Bailey and filming on uh, Clear Lake with this guy because the reason what I think buzz baits really do is when they're displacing that, they look like waterfowl. They look like a small duck, a small coot something running across the surface and now when i have two i have extra commotion and it looks like two feet did, 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 running across the surface like a small duck or something trying to take off out of there a blackbird something hit the surface and try to take up off the surface that's what i think so i think what's going on there is you want to have the double blades to even make more commotion um, if i'm going to have a single blade i might as well be throwing a walking bait uh, or a frog at that point, but I'll get into that. The buzz bait draws up a very large bite. I'm not going to say go grab any buzz bait and be ready to go. Um, there's simple things along with the buzz bait. Yes, it's going to get bit. Um, if you watch the Clear Lake episode, you're going to see how we talk about putting a horny toad on the back for a focal point, slowing it down, causing more displacement. A black horny toad is what I'm using for a better focal point for them to eat it. I don't use a trailer hook on my buzz baits. A lot of people use a trailer hook. I honestly think the trailer hook is when you don't have the right profile bait as a trailer on the back of there uh, that they're missing. Yeah, maybe you want a trailer hook at that point, but it's way more weedless with this one hook. Uh, this is a DNM uh, double hammer buzz bait right here. The hookup ratio with that on the back is really, really good. Along with this bait, you want to be throwing it on braid. You're going to be throwing this around timber, uh, sparse grass on the surface. You want 50 to 65 pound braid. That's only 12 to 15 pound diameter. I'm sure you already knew that, but you need to be able to hoist that fish out around timber. You're in there bumping logs coming by. You need to be able to hoist them out. Um, a high speed reel, I would say a bare minimal of six, three to one. Um, if you don't understand the bait casting reels, go watch my bait casting reel basics and you'll see. Um, six, three to one means just um, 6.3 times the spool rotates around per one revolution of the handle in case you didn't know. Uh, but you need a faster reel to keep that buzz bait up on the surface. A slow reel, the bait will be porpoising a lot going under the water. You need to keep it up on top. Um, I honestly throw it on a seven to one. The downside when you get into the faster reels, the drag is not as strong and we're fishing for big fish. I do need a strong enough drag to where when he pulls it down under timber, I can pull him back up and my reel's not feeding him line and he's going under and wrapping around something. So I honestly prefer to throw this on the 6.3, uh, though on the Delta I've been fishing around so much sparse grass, I'm throwing it on the 7 to keep it plain and faster and up on the surface. Um, initially, when I hook that fish, I'll thumb the spool with my thumb into where it's not letting off drag, hoist them out and around that stuff, and then start bringing them and fighting them on the reel at that point. But I'm using my thumb uh, as added drag, so you can try that. Um, so that's your buzz bait right there. Let's pick up another. Hang with us guys, we'll be right back. Hey sportsmen, have you ever wanted an all-in-one cleaning tool for small game or fish? Well look no further, the Sportsman Field Tool offers an all-in-one stainless steel construction with all the bells and whistles. From a fillet knife, snip, snub knife, gut rake, and a scaler in its indestructible case, you really can't go wrong. Check your local retailers or visit sportsmanfieldtool.com. Attention Northern California anglers, have you been to boat country in Escalon? With one of the largest selections of welded aluminum fishing boats from Weld Craft Low and Hughes Craft, chances are they've got the right fishing boat for you. And did I mention they have a full service center to take care of all your boating, repair, and maintenance needs? If you're a boat owner or just looking to become one, you owe it to yourself to check these guys out. Visit BoatCountryUSA.com or stop on by. 
I'll see you there. Ever tried pulling a planer board next to your boat when trolling or fishing from a swift current bank? If not, you're missing out on one of the most phenomenal fish catching machines on the market today. With Yellowbird planer boards pulling your lines perpendicular to your boat, you can't help but catch more fish. Find out more by visiting www.yellowbirdproducts.com. Did you know that P-Line makes specialized lines for all your fishing needs from the super strong abrasive resistant CXX or the low stretch super stealthy CX Premium? Or maybe you're looking for invisibility or super bite detection with P-Line's 100% fluorocarbon. No matter what your needs, P-Line's got it covered. To find out more, visit P-Line.com. P-Line, baby! Have you had the opportunity to try out the only waterproof, near weightless, shapeable, hands-free LED light on the market? That's right, I'm talking about the Lou Reviewer, the most versatile, multi-functioning LED light available. Choose from its alligator clip or the super strong rare earth magnet that best suits your needs. I guess the only question is, how do you Lure Reviewer? So now that we got the buzz bait out of the way, and we're going to get into the rod, uh, what I throw that on, so I, since I talked about the line, let's pick up the infamous swim bait. Every bass fisherman has heard that swim baits catch giant bass. Well, guess what? It's true. They do. They catch giant bass. What is it about the swim bait that catches giant bass? It's big. It looks natural. It has a subtle profile. I'm going to explain something to you about a big bass versus a small bass, and I'm going to use myself as an example. Uh, I recently just did a seminar on this, and I was actually shocked that quite a few people didn't get the basics for why a big bass comes after a big bait versus a small bait. Let's take for an example, this is a double whopper and this Senko here is a french fry. The french fry is closer to me and this double whopper is only about 10 feet further off. Well I'm over here, I walk in and I'm hungry. What do you think more likely a big guy like myself is going to go for? This french fry or this double whopper that's 10 feet away? Well, clearly, I want the double whopper. I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty darn good to me right now. I'm going to make my way over when this double whopper is cruising by here and take my attempt at the double whopper. Now, if I'm a two-pound fish versus an eight-pound fish, maybe this french fry works for me. And this french fry is going to appeal to a lot more smaller fish, but this one eight-pounder that you've been fishing for, you may have thrown down hundreds of yards on that bank and you never passed an eight pounder. So let's say you were throwing this guy fishing for your three to five bites. Well, you may only pass three, seven to eight to 10 pound range fish in that day. And that may have taken you three hours to pass that one eight pound fish. Well, guess what? Here comes the double whopper. And if you were throwing this French fry by him and you missed him by 20 feet, he may have not said, you know what? That's a French fry. I'm not going to go burn 50 calories or 60 calories to go catch a french fry. I'm going to wait until that double whopper comes cruising by. Now, here's a ton of calories for him. This can hold him over for a couple days. Now he's going to cruise out, boom, and eat this. And it may have taken you three hours to pass that one fish, but guess what? That double whopper is going to do it for him, not the french fry. So if you miss him by 20 feet with the Senko, which is the french fry, he may not go get it. But if you miss them, oftentimes 30, 50 feet away, a swim bait will draw a big fish out because it's a big meal for them. They will make the effort for this. Yes, you can catch a big fish with a smaller worm, but it literally has to fall right in front of their snout to get them. So if you already know where they are, yeah, you can drop a drop shot or something on their head and get that fish. But if you don't know where they are, that big swim bait, they're going to come out and get it. Um, swim baits excel through basically I would say later fall because a lot of the time the bait fish is pushing into the creeks and they're still appealing to more shad or whatever your bait fish is. They're appealing to more smaller baits. You're getting more fish on those. But if you do throw a swim bait year round, you can catch big fish. Um, it just doesn't do as good through later spring uh, to early fall. That's probably its slowest times. Later fall to mid spring, swim baits excel. Uh, the cleaner the water, swim baits perform even better. Um, they do perform in dingy water. If you look at Clear Lake, we're going to get back out there with Paul in November. Look at some of past, Paul's past videos, and you will see Clear Lake is not that clear, and he hammers them year-round on swim baits. Uh, so that's your swim bait there. The minimal line I throw on a 8-inch swim bait and up, this is an 8-inch. Um, you can get into your smaller swim baits and appeal to other fish, but we're talking about trophy hunting here, fishing for big bass. The minimal line I will throw is 15 pound fluorocarbon. It used to be 20. 
I went out to shoot that swim bait episode with Joe Bruce, and Joe goes, no, I'm throwing my huds on 15 pound because I think it gets me an extra bite from time to time. A guy who's got 50 plus 10 pounders, I'm gonna listen to. Joe knows what he's talking about. He's got way more experience fishing for those big ones than I do on big swim baits. So I will attempt that 15 pound, even though it gets my heart racing if I hook a big one. But uh, you know, 20 pounds a good line for you to get started off with. If you're up into that five plus ounce bait range, you might want to go to 25 pound fluorocarbon. And um, we'll get into the gear on throwing this guy here shortly. Okay, so now we have the buzz bait and the swim bait for giant bass, two of the most common methods for catching them. Let's say you have a lot of vegetation in your lake or you're fishing the, the delta like me or Okeechobee in Florida. Have you heard of punching? Um, if you're an experienced bass angler and you're watching this, I'm sure you already know what punching is about. Basically, you have a heavy tungsten weight penetrates through. You have a creature bait of some sort like this uh, sweet beaver right here, three, four, five, six aught flipping hook, straight shank hook with that snell uh, on the back of there to where the hook, when it pushes up against the weight, cavitates out to the side to penetrate that hook in that fish's mouth. Basically, punching, what punching is all about is penetrating heavy cover whether that's hyacinth mats, whether that's lay down of toolies, toolies are all smashed down, old dead toolie mat, or penny wart, or pepper grass, or milfoil, whatever's creating a mat on that surface, the weights you penetrate with uh, for your tungsten weights, ounce and a half is standard. Um, some guys will go up to two ounce, but I honestly feel an ounce and a half is all you need. I've been using these Miller punching weights lately. I absolutely love this thing. It makes punching a heck of a lot easier for me. The minimal line you want to punch on is 65 pound braid. Um, lately, I've, there's been a few times where I went up to 80, but 65 pound is a really good standard. I'm using the new P-Line Spectrix. It's incredibly strong and it's a very rounded braid, comes through very easy, and you can pull out an absolute horse with this thing. Now, what is it about punching? that's getting your giant fish. That's the explanation right here. Of course, you're, you hear these guys and you see these guys punching through these mats and pulling out these giant fish. Why is that? What are the giant fish doing under there? And everybody tells me, well, it's sunny, it's the summer, they're going in there for shade. Sure they are, it's just like a boat dock. But what is it about penetrating directly through? What, why are the giants grabbing it the second it penetrates through that mat, a giant bass is grabbing it? Even before it hits the bottom, this thing is dropping like a bullet, boom, when it comes through those hyacinths. It's a heavy weight, it's dropping down quick. And we all know we use the lightest weight possible on a plastic to get down or penetrate whatever we're trying to penetrate. But in this case, we're dropping through lightning fast. What is that about? Well, if you pick up hyacinths or pennywort and you pull it up, you pull up enough of it, one thing you're gonna notice is there's crawdads under there hanging on. They love it especially in the Delta, especially in like lakes like Okeechobee or down south where there's a lot of grass mats, the crawdads are hanging up under there. What do bass love more than anything else for a big meal? What do the big girls love? They love things that look like crawdads. Red and black things, things with appendages that looks like crawdads. Those crawdads are up under there. So what happens is when you penetrate that mat and this bait comes through real fast, it looks like a crawdad shooting out of the hyacinths for safety. Like a bird or something snapped at him from the top and he shot straight down real fast. If you ever see a crawdad go through the water, it's boom, 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 real fast down. These bass are up under there looking and the second this thing shoots through, they commit. So yeah, it's not huge, but the big bass are waiting for crawfish and looking around, searching those mats. So the second that penetrates, they want it and they take it. So that's why you have to have that stout line to pull them through those mats. You have to have a good weight to get through there. Um, the most common baits for punching, which you'll have a lot of success, uh, Sweet Beavers, really good, Missile Baits, D-Bomb, um, Gary Yamamoto, Flappin' Hog. Those are three really good ones to get started off with. Dark colors are crucial. And I'll tell you what, you see this Miller Punch Weight right here in this lighter green? The reason why I've been using this one lately is a lot of the time I'll set the bobber stop up there to where this weight will fall further up and this weight will penetrate without having too much profile to penetrate through a mat. The weight will come up here, hit the bobber stop, penetrate, creating a nice little hole. Then this will come through really easy. 
uh, versus your other style punch weight that's right there up on the front you force the whole mass down through at once and that works really good and makes a lot of commotion uh, but the Miller punch weight comes through very subtle and sneaks through there so the reason why this lighter color I have two things coming through at two different times the darker in darker water darker colors excel to where when this lighter thing comes through I want them to see my darker bait oftentimes I'll use black and blue or black and red uh, when the Sun comes out I'll incorporate more of a red bait uh, but when it's low light and you know I got overcast I'm using black and blue 99% of the time and I guarantee you will get bit on that the reason why is it shows up they have a better profile that lighter green doesn't show up as well I want them to focus on my bait not my weight so keep that in mind and we'll get into the gear for this guy shortly all right another popular bait for catching huge bass is the hollow body frogs right here I just have a spro frog with a leopard bottom like this to make it really simple on you the only frogs you need is an all black bottom frog or like a leopard pattern a natural pattern just like this here the things you want to do to your frog right outside the box to catch big bass on them you generally want to pull your hooks a little bit looser because sometimes the hooks will be forced up against the body you can bend them out slightly you don't have to it's going to increase your hookup ratio you can shorten the legs a little bit that always helps if you want your bait to walk back and side to side if you're doing a walk the dog style on your bait shorten one leg more than the other you can see on this frog right here my legs are virtually the same length well what's this all about I actually did solder I wrapped my hooks with solder back here to where this frog sits a little bit deeper I'm using this guy in a little bit thicker of slime and snotty grass to where he sits back a little bit in the water like this and he's got more weight because if you ever fished a frog and you've seen him bust the mat sometimes your frog will go wee and flip off the top of the mat that's because your frog's too light what the bass often does is he comes right here and he starts to inhale as he's coming up and if your frog's light it's still sitting on top of that grass he's sucking right there but a little added weight that frog will oftentimes come through that grass and he'll get a better chomp down on those hooks so uh, keep that in mind when you're fishing the frog if I'm fish in sparse grass thin grass not real thick mats if I'm searching a lot of water I'll have one leg a little bit shorter than the other I won't have that solder wrap on there and another thing I'll do I'll take a treble hook I don't have it here I'll take a treble hook I'll cut one hook off to where it'll lay flat on the body I'll use 65 pound braid and tie it to the nose so where I have another treble hook sitting right there um, I'll try to put up an illustration for you and I'm using that on sparse grass because a lot of the time when you're working it fast and you're searching for them they'll hit the head they'll hit somewhere and you your hookup ratio will be really really low if you don't have a little stinger hook or a trailer hook on your frog the thing you need to do to have a higher hookup ratio for those trophy fish on this thing is fish it slow hit the prime spot barely twitch it work it a little bit slap your rod tip and let that big fish come and get it the reason why the frog appeals to a big bass is it's a big meal they're eating an amphibian okay this thing this is a frog this is not a fish it's got a full-on little skeleton in it it's got a ton of protein this is a big meal for a big bass this is gonna hold over that big bass but if this meal is flying along fast and you miss her by five or six feet chances are she's not gonna come get it but if you're slowly twitching it slowly twitching it and then you miss her by five or six feet and it's sitting there and it's just twitching she'll come up and look at it if you stop it in a pocket for five or six seconds and twitch it sometimes you're gonna start seeing you're gonna start seeing more often than not the big bass come up and look at it and then you're gonna twitch it and she's gonna go and you're gonna see her frog just shoot down her throat watch your line watch your braid the whole time you need a minimal of 50 pound braid a lot of guys will throw it on 65 I like 50 okay because I can get a little bit more yardage on my cast 50 cast a little bit better uh, than your 65 one thing you need to keep in mind it's a thinner diameter to where if you do a snapping hook set a lot of the times you will still break your line at 50 pound diameter braid has zero stretch so you're cracking the whip on that thing so what you can do is back off your drag a little bit just a hair more than you think you need and that'll prevent a lot of breakoffs but the frog has a lot of appeal for catching a giant bass hang with us guys we'll be right back 
Been thinking about trying out kayak fishing or already into it and just want some sick upgrades for your rig? It's time to check out the Headwaters Kayak Shop. Come pick the brains of their knowledgeable staff and make sure to ask about their awesome demo program to find the right kayak for you. Or stop in and rent one with Lodi Lake right down the street. The Headwaters Kayak Shop fits all your yakking needs. Tell them if sent ya. Have you been to RustyLures.com? Did you know they offer free shipping on anything over $29.99? And with all the latest and greatest in bass fishing gear from punching tackle, umbrella rigs, swim baits, and you name it, there's really no reason for you not to be getting the best deal online today. So go to www.RustyLures.com. Did you ever wish for an RC boat when you were a kid? And do you have a passion for fishing? Well, guess what? It's time to do them both at the same time. With RCFishingWorld.com's RC Fishing Pole, it's time to be a kid again. So visit www.rcfishingworld.com today. All right, so now let's get into walking baits. Another topwater bait right here. Topwater does have a tendency to pull bigger fish, even poppers do. This is a walk the dog style bait right here. This is a pencil bait. You've probably heard of spooks. You've heard of sammies. You've heard of vixens. You've heard of sexy dogs. There's a million of them out there, all right? A walk the dog style bait, and I'll show you the retrieval in the pool. If you don't already know, uh, looking at this video you should know how to walk the dog but I'll go over it anyways a walk the dog style bait is imperative for catching big bass if you have calm water out there in the morning on your lake there's no wind clear water a walk the dog style bait draws up big fish you will still catch some smaller fish on this but big fish will come out to get a walking bait walk walk pause walk walk pause I always go with a real natural look on the bottom um, even in dingy water, I still seem to get bit. The one thing you want to pay attention to when you're fishing a bait that you know you're going to get big fish on, don't fish any bait with stock split rings and stock hooks. I upgrade my split rings and I upgrade my hooks to those bigger, stouter trocar hooks. Um, it sometimes will ne negatively affect your bait if you go with a bigger hook. Um, so if you notice your bait's actions failed, um, still go with the same size hook that came on the bait, but upgrade them. Uh, trocars or you know another high-end quality hook the triple grips the must add ones are also very good uh, KVD designed those for a better bite on the fish uh, but you will see on this hook the tips point back towards the shank of the hook the backbone of the hook there what this does is they're not the round bends they point back in to where it penetrates that fish deeper and hangs on better you need to remember when you're fishing with treble hooks usually one or two hooks penetrate if you look at that one single part of the hook and not the other two, it's actually quite small to where when you're hoisting the fish, you have a little tiny hook point that you're putting a lot of pressure on. So you do need those stronger hooks. I've switched my top water. I throw all my top water baits, even in clear water. I was fishing party at media day. I'm fishing 50 pound braid. You can cast it a mile. It's stout. It holds up. You can fish it a long time. It's very buoyant. Um, I will probably never fish mono for my top water again because even in that crystal clear water, I notice they don't seem to care about braid. Uh, my good buddy Matt Newman, the owner of iRod, fishes all of his top water on braid. An incredible angler, and we'll get into that later on more of his swim bait stuff, and hopefully we'll get Matt to come out on the show. Uh, but your walking baits draw up fish on those calm, slick surfaces. A walking bait will get you a big bite. Just upgrade your stuff and we'll get into the gear that I'm using this on as well. But that 50 pound braid will do it. Now we're gonna start getting into the baits that will catch smaller fish, you will catch more fish, but you can still catch a giant. Here's a square bill, for example, square bill crankbait. I have this in a craw pattern. 90% uh, of the time when I'm fishing a crankbait, you're gonna see me throwing black and red. Big fish love crawfish. I want to make sure I can appeal to that fish if they're getting a good look at it, not just reacting. When I mention reacting, crankbaits, that's pretty much all I'm looking for is a reaction strike. What I'm looking to do with a square bill here is I'm looking to deflect off of rocks. I'm deflecting off of everything. I'm hitting everything. A crankbait is a search bait. You're, out, you're down there actively searching for the fish usually you come flying right by that bass's head when they eat that crankbait you're forcing them to react to that bait that's why i like that black and red they think it's a crawfish shooting by real fast and i'm retrieving my crankbaits a lot faster than you would think i throw it on a 6.3 a lot of guys throw their crankbaits on the five speed reels i actually go a little bit faster i'm fishing on the six i want to cover water i'm forcing those bass to react 
the most imperative thing that you need to keep in mind when you're fishing a crankbait and you're looking for big fish, fish fast, hit everything. You are going to hang up and you're going to lose baits. The same rule applies. Upgrade your split rings, upgrade your hooks. Beat the heck out of a crankbait. As long as you're fishing it fast and you're ramming into cover and structure, you are going to cause a big fish to react. You will catch a lot of small fish at the same time, but the chances are you will end up hooking a big one if you can do that. When the grass starts growing up later in the season, I'll often put the crankbait down. But in the fall, later fall, early fall, early spring, mid spring, you will see a crankbait and me launching it all of the time to get that bigger fish. Um, my square bill hill, my square bill here is deflecting off that shallow rock, a uh, bigger, deeper diver. This happens to be more of a shad pattern, uh, but I will, I will get these other style here in the crawfish pattern and get down there and search deeper. But I'm always looking to grind into things and I'm always fishing it fast to score that reaction strike. You'll see Kevin Van Dam fishing the crankbaits constantly. One of the best guys of all time fishing them constantly. And you will see him catch endless amounts of small fish. And you say, well, why does he put it down? Because he knows he's getting them to react. He will sting a big one at the same time. Watch Bassmasters, watch FLW. You see those guys ledge fishing. And more often than not, they're throwing a crankbait even over a jig. Uh, that's our next bait we're going to get into, but remember the crankbaits, as long as you're deflecting, fishing them fast, you'll get them to react. The line size means a lot for a crankbait. The thinner, the lower diameter line size you go down in is how you're going to get deeper. Um, the bigger the diameter is going to force this bait up shallower. You just got to remember, you really got to ride your drag out good. You have to have a good quality rod. The rod I happen to use on the crankbaits right here is that new 7-Eleven uh, cranking, big cranking stick that uh, iRod just came out with. Uh, absolutely killer rod for these bigger crankbaits and uh, these square bills like this. There's a riprap rod that they have actually have specialized. Um, I'm not sure if they designed it for the California Delta, but I fish it on the Delta all the time, which allows me the accuracy for fishing my square bills. But these crankbaits will get you a ton of bass and big bass if you work it fast and deflect. Okay, so let's get into jigs, whether we have your conventional style jig here or your new vibrating style jig here. Well, it's, I wouldn't say new, but way, way newer than your conventional jig. This is a vibrating jig right here. Um, a lot of people know them as chatterbaits uh, versus your conventional right here without the little uh, lip on there, without the little vibrating chatter part. Jigs have been known for catching bigger fish forever. What is it about a jig that catches a bigger fish? It's slower moving. Oftentimes they look like crawfish. I have this little trailer on here. They look like crawfish. They're a bigger profile. You move them slower. They're associating to the bottom. Bottom, a lot of the times crawfish around rocks. Thicker, bigger profile, bigger bass. Bigger trailer looks like a crawfish. Bass love crawfish. So you're imitating crawfish more often than not. Even though this is in a bluegill pattern right here, Sometimes you will see those lighter colored crawfish. Uh, that happened to be what I was doing here. I seen lighter colored crawfish. I matched it up. Jigs, especially football jigs, have been known for catching big bass over the years, constantly. Throw them down there around the rocks, drag them slow. Bottom contact with the jig is more important than anything else for catching a big bass. Unless you're using a flipping jig with a pointed nose and you're flipping it into stuff, jigs have big profiles the skirts, living rubber, silicon mixed together. You have a big profile. It shows the bass a big profile. You can still get smaller bass with a jig, but it's a lot like the crankbait. They see it as a good opportunity and the big bass will come and get it. The one thing you need to keep in mind when you're working a jig, especially a football jig, and you're dragging it across the bottom, those bigger fish want bottom contact and they want it slower. You have to give them time to come over and get it. It's not like a crankbait where you burn it and get them to react to it. This is a lot like that uh, that frog. When it's on the surface, we worked it slow, we stopped it, we gave them time to come get it. This is the exact opposite. We're working on the bottom. Let's say you click a rock, you hop it over. They heard it, they seen it. Now they come over to inspect it, and now you go whoop, whoop, boom. That's when you get them. A fast retrieve across the bottom with a jig is really not what you want. Uh, use plastics and other stuff for that. But the jig has big fish appeal written all over it. Um, same thing with the jig is your, your line is really going to help you get down a little bit faster. 
Um, nine times out of ten, I'm throwing a jig on 100% P-line fluorocarbon. Uh, 15 pound is usually what I'm using for all my jigs, unless I'm in the Delta, then I'm on 20 pound. But the jig is going to get a lot of big fish for you. Black and red is usually what I'm using. Uh, in the fall, I'll switch over to a shad pattern, but that black and red is always going to get my bigger fish. So even in the fall, if I'm looking and there's shad around, but I want the bigger fish, I'm going black and red all the time. Everybody knows spinner baits catch big bass in the spring. If you go to any smart bass fisherman, you'll see a spinner bait on his deck in the spring. But realistically, spinner baits catch fish year round. They're extremely versatile. What I do when I'm hunting for the giants is I fish black and red spinner baits and I fish heavy. I'm down there dredging across the bottom with a big single Colorado blade that's doop, 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 kicking hard. It's in black and red. It looks like a crawfish. Crawfish kick, boom, 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 coming through there. When I'm throwing a spinner bait, I'm throwing bigger. I don't want small bass on my spinner bait. I want big bass. So a lot of the times, if there's crawfish around, I'm throwing black and red. I'm down there dredging along the bottom. If there's a lot of shad around, I'm going to throw a bigger spinner bait with big willow leaves, double willow leaves, bigger skirt to show a bigger profile. Remember, big appeals to bigger fish. So what I happen to be doing on this right here, California Delta, I fish this a lot in the spring. I'll fish it even in summer mornings, fall mornings, but I'm getting close to the bottom. It's making a ton of noise with that big Colorado. Black and red, looks like a crawfish. Uh, the only reason I don't have a trailer on this one is I bump toolies with it. I come in there, this big Colorado blade's kicking around and I'm running into toolies. I'm actually forcing that reaction strike out of those bass uh, like I would with a crankbait, but I can't bump toolies too well with two big exposed treble hooks uh, but this big spinner bait I can come in there and actually bump into that cover and into that structure a lot more weedlessly and get them to react so that deflecting off rocks a lot of grass a lot of timber around this is not going to work as well as that spinner bait would at that point guys tell me all the time I know you're talking about the big baits thing and everything to get big bites but how come guys keep catching big bass on Senkos a stick worm, a Bass Pro Shop sticko, any ninja stick style worm, chopstick style, whatever you want to call it, how are they catching big bass on it? I see all these beginners and even these intermediate level guys and weekend fishermen and bass fishermen tournament guys not catching big fish on a Senko, a chopstick style worm. What is it? I'm going to plain and simply tell you, here's the trick. Cast it out in that key spot, let it get to the bottom, count to five, reel it in real fast, throw it to the next spot. Don't shake it, you don't even need to retrieve it, throw it out there and dead stick it. Dead sticking a chopstick style bait gets you a bigger bass. Let it fall, that fall is enough action. Uh, the straight worm falls down there, lays on the bottom, they've seen it fall, the big bass comes up to inspect it, it doesn't even need to move. She'll pick it up and eat it. Once you start twitching it and hopping it, it appeals to small fish. They'll run over and eat it. So yes, you can catch a ton of fish on this conventional style, chopstick style plastic right here, but dead sticking it, holding it still on the bottom for a few seconds, picking it up and doing it again is what's going to appeal to that bigger fish and less little fish are gonna be attracted by the dead stick um, and more big fish will be attracted by the dead stick. They see it as an easy opportunity, and they will come over and get it. That's the trick. Oftentimes, if I'm looking for that bigger one, I'm throwing in black and red. If I'm looking for more bites, I will still do the dead stick to look for more quality bites. But in that green pumpkin watermelon pattern, it's going to get you a lot of bites. Black and red is going to get you the bigger bites. Okay, so for my swim baits, these are what I consider a swim bait and not really just a regular bait in general is a big swim bait, you know, six, seven inches, eight inches, and up from there, 10, 12, you name it. I'm throwing them on the I-Rod large swim is what I throw most of my eight inch baits with. If I'm up to that 10 and 12 inch baits, I'll go to the jumbo swim. These are extremely powerful rods. Uh, Matt Newman's the owner of I-Rod. Matt's an incredible swim bait fisherman, probably the best in California in my opinion. He knows what goes into a swim bait rod. That's that's how I got started with iRod because I wanted a good swim bait rod and Matt knows his stuff. 
Matt knows a heck of a lot more about rods than me, and trust me, I know a lot. Uh, the jumbo swim is what I'm throwing the big giants on. Large swim is what I'm throwing most 8-inch baits on, like Huddleston's and things like that. Now, for my buzz baits, I didn't bring the rod with me, uh, but he, they just came out with a new rod. It's the Andy Morgan rod. It's the light flipping. It's a heavy, but it's got a really cushiony tip. If you watch the Clear Lake episode with Paul Bailey, what we're throwing the buzz baits on, the rod's absolutely killer. It loads up. It's not too snappy. Really throws those buzz baits out there really well. It's got a good backbone. Um, on that rod, you want to have that 65 pound braid like I was talking about, and you want to have at least a six speed reel, six three and up. So uh, if you want to go seven, put your thumb on the reel when you set the hook um, to where the fish doesn't pull you in and around timber, hoist them out, then reel them up on the reel. What I forgot to mention on my swim bait, uh, reels. I use Corrado's. I use those deeper spools and it's not that you necessarily want more line on. You have a big thicker diameter line so you want to be able to support all that line and get a good long cast out there. Slow speeds on my swim bait reels are pretty crucial. I think this one's a 5.3. It's an old school one. I had it painted black but I have that 20 pound fluorocarbon on there. The reason for the low speed is extremely strong drag. You have one thing I forgot to mention, a lot of weight in that fish's mouth. When he grabs it and starts hoisting and you have a giant fish pulling around, you need to be able to have strong drag. And you need to stay on the reel, hoisting him in. Don't give him time. If he comes up to the surface, pull him down, keep his head down. I'm also going to talk about fight, fighting the giant fish a little bit more here. Uh, but that's that reel for that swim bait, the buzz bait. Uh, that new Andy Morgan light flipping stick is killer. I think they're on back order right now, but you'd have to call up Matt for that. The frog rod. I'm throwing the Fred Rumbanis Gen 2 I-Rod right here. This thing is feather light. It's got the perfect tip for working the frog, for casting it out there. I've been on a Quantum Smoke 7-speed reel. I'm covering water fast. I'll do the exact same thing because the drag is not strong. If I'm next to timber and I hook one, I'll put my thumb on the spool, hoist them out of there. Keep it in mind when you're fishing the 50-pound braid that you can snap off if you do a really whippy hook set. Uh, a lot of the time, reel into them when you feel them, lean into them. Um, that's enough to drive those hooks home. Oftentimes, it won't send the frog out of the strike zone if you lean into them. If they miss, it'll just move the frog up a couple feet. You might have a second chance opportunity at hooking that fish. Um, with my jigs, my worms, I am throwing the, the my tangled up here. It's the IRG 744C medium heavy. I went over this rod in the beginner how to fish episode. It's a very versatile lighter bait rod. This is in the beginner how to bass fish episode. Uh, check this rod out. It's a very cool worm rod and more versatile smaller jigs. Um, the winter transitions bass fishing episode I did with Andy Kachi on the Delta. This was the rod I was fishing for my jigs. It was a little bit light for that time of year uh, for catching the size of bass we were catching, but I loved it and it's a very versatile rod for me. Um, the same thing with my walking baits. I'm going to go back to that frog rod, that Gen 2 frog rod, that Fred Rubanis design. Uh, absolutely killer for my walking baits. For my punching ones, they have the Gen 2 Bub Tosh Rod. That Bub design, Bub's an incredible puncher out here on the California Delta. He knows what he's doing. He and Matt were on that rod for a long time, getting it perfect. It's absolutely the best punching rod on the market. For my square bills, there's that Rip Wrap style rod that they have by iRod, which was killer. Um, then they have that 711. I love a really, really long rod that loads up. It has a nice parabolic bend to it. Not too quick of a tip, not too much backbone. It's that happy medium. I love a long rod because it gives me a long cast and it lets me load into that fish, have a lot of cushion. If he swims towards me and I happen to be on that 6.3, a little bit slower speed, it's going to suck up a lot of that loose line for me. I'm Nick the Informative Fisherman, and that's how you can catch giant bass. Thanks for watching, guys. Make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Go to my website, join the mailing list, stay up to date on the videos, informativefisherman.com. We'll see you next time.